So we're looking at uh, figures of speech that uh, refer to believe. Now you can use the word repent, because repent relative to salvation means to change your mind about not believing in Christ as Savior, and then trust alone in Him alone, or believe alone in Him alone, or have faith alone in Him alone, or any one of the other figures of speech. Let me just show you that you can move to the study of repent, means meta noea, meta to change the way of the mind, then you have to look at the context to see what is the change of mind from one thing to the next, to do or to think, to believe, you know. So let's look at John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten or one and only son, <clears throat> that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now if you you changed your mind here. It's implied because God so loved the world. If you find out that he gave his one only son for your sins, you have that knowledge that's given to you, and you decide to believe it, then the decision comes from not believing to believing in it. And whoever believes in him, therefore, you change your mind to not believing to believe, and then you shall not perish but have an eternal life. And look down a couple of verses. It kind of summarizes this. He who believes in him is not judged. You changed your mind to believe. Then you're not judged under condemnation. But on the other side, he who does not believe has been judged already. So you're under condemnation because you have not believed yet. Because he has not believed in the name of the only one and only begotten Son of God. So you're under judgment. You get born, you grow up, get a cannibal age, and so far you haven't believed yet. And so therefore, not believing, you're under condemnation. You've been judged already. So you have to change your mind, not your behavior. And therefore, you believe, and you're not judged. It doesn't ask you to repent of all your sins. It asks you to repent from not believing to believing. Isn't that interesting? Now you can take a look at this study on repent. <clears throat> Let's go to we'll, we'll touch the continued button on the word repent. Repentance is defined in God's word. It's a big long study. But it starts off with the simple verb, metanoia, metanoia, rendered to repent, and repentance means a change of mind. Meta is to change, noia is the mind. One quick thing here. For example, in 2 Tim 2, 24-25, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach patience, teach patient in humility correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth those who oppose me must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth so you don't want to believe it see if you have a knowledge of something in the sense that you receive teaching from Pastor Timothy and you accept it as true but these people didn't want to and they were opposed to what he was teaching so God grant them repentance from not accepting as true what Timothy was teaching to accepting what was true, that what Tim Timothy was teaching. See how that works. It's all about context. In any case, conclusion. These are figures of speech. These pictures of faith, they're figures of speech, all denote receptivity, agreement, or trust. All are essentially simple activities and essentially passive. There's no proactive contributory thing. Christ did it all on the cross for you. All you have to do is, did you believe he did it? You don't have to promise anything either. <clears throat> Fortunately, because I can't make my promises good. None communicates the idea of merit, work, effort, or achievement. Remember, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that salvation is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So neither do they communicate an exchange of one's life <clears throat> or the ongoing submission of one's life to Jesus as master 
in order to obtain eternal life. When we observe the clear statements in John about the condition for salvation, the effect of this condition, and the pictures of this condition, we conclude that John presents faith alone in Christ alone as the only condition for salvation unto eternal life. It is extremely significant that we do not see qualifiers with the word believe. John does not condition salvation unto eternal life on whether one really believes or truly believes. Neither does he speak of genuine faith, real faith, or effectual faith. It's, these are kind of uh, redundant discussions because if you believe something, whether it's true or, or not in terms of the information that you were given, um, it's a genuine belief. You don't have to say, I have a genuine belief because you have you can't have a non-genuine belief. You have a real faith or an unreal faith or effectual faith or faith that's a, that isn't effectual. There's only one kind of faith. One either believes in something or he does not. <clears throat> Therefore, those who speak of spurious faith or false faith or psychologizing faith in as bad English as the scripture neither does nor provides its basis for doing. In contrast, <clears throat> John does use qualifiers to distinguish the real from the fraudulent in other concepts. He speaks of the true light, true bread, true vine, true worshippers, <clears throat> and true God. When he shows that even the unsaved can be referred to as disciples, he later calls the saved who adhere to his word disciples indeed. Neither do we find the condition for salvation stand, stated as surrender or commitment of all of one's life to Jesus as master. Salvation is totally and absolutely free, and is not conditioned on human merit, and it is what one receives, not earns, merits, or bargains for. It will be given freely to whoever asks. Now let's take a look. John 4.10. There's so much confirmation of this, but I'm glad we're getting through this because this is key. Most people that are close to the gospel but don't have salvation yet. Don't get this. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, knew meaning believe, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the issue is not the quality or quantity of an individual's faith, or how he acts thereafter, but to whom that faith is directed, which will produce eternal life. Do you know Jesus in the sense that you know that he died for your sins, in the sense of believing in it. If it is directed toward Jesus Christ, you get eternal life. <clears throat> so, point D, salvation requires faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing. Salvation is not conditioned upon continual obedience. Charles Bing goes on to say, similarly, <clears throat> we do not find salvation conditioned on or will result in continual obedience. I can't claim to be continually obedient, which means if you're obedient, you're not sinning anything because doing any sinning is disobedient. When John 1 8 says that we claim to be without sin, we're liars. Take a look at that so you read it. <clears throat> I quote stuff and I should, really should open it up and show you because I might misquote it. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, him, and his, God's word, is not in us. So you can't say, we have no sin, up to this point. <clears throat> How I say, I have not sinned at all for a period of time, or ever. It doesn't make any difference, it doesn't give you the length of time. So for one second, you can say, well, I haven't sinned in that last second. You're a liar. I don't have any seconds I've, I've said. I have no sin for a period of time. You're a liar. And that's why God makes grace provision for your temporal life to confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the grace provision. <clears throat> now, if you say that once you're a believer, you're not going to sin anymore. You're going to sin less and less to the point where you get to uh, a sanctified, perfect uh, sinless perfection, temporal life. Well, it's not the truth. Besides that, sins are not the issue. It's whether you've been forgiven, and that only takes an instant of time. Sins have been paid for, and they've been forgiven, 
everything past, present, and future. So even the future things you do, does that give you permission to sin? No, because if you do, you're under his discipline, and you better confess them. But aren't those sins covered for eternal life? Absolutely. But if you do commit those sins, you're under his discipline, not under his blessing. You're outside of his fellowship. That's another story. So, we do not find salvation condition on or, we, or will result in continual obedience. If anything, we could argue that John's gospel purposefully introduces us to those who believed in Jesus as Savior, but were less than fully committed as disciples or were partially obeying him. Martha believed <clears throat> and was obviously saved, 1127. And we can assume Mary and Lazarus were too. But there is no indication that she followed Christ in the fullest sense of leaving home and family. Less than full confession and commitment are also found in the secret disciple Joseph of Arimathea. Some would argue that Nicodemus was also in this category. John 19.39 In addition, the Jewish rulers mentioned in John 12.42 believed in Christ but did not confess him publicly for fear of being ostracized by the other Jewish rulers. Our remark, yet nothing in Scripture indicates that they were not truly saved, and John 1, 12 to 13 stipulates that anyone who believes is saved. And, by the way, if you can't born again children of God, can God unborn again you? You are his child. Can your parents unborn you? Take away their DNA? No. So the concept is permanence. Once you become a child of God, the family of God is that's your family. That's wonderful. You know, you can then struggle in the Christian life. Who doesn't? Be tested, persevere, turn your back. I get upset because I don't like a lot of testing. I wonder when is this gonna end? I can't wait to be extracted from the face of the planet or be going home with the Lord. I don't know which will come first, because it's getting to the end of the age. Compare Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this salvation is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Do you pay God for a gift by good behavior? No. Should you uh, be the family of God? You're part of the family of God, represented? Yes, but you're not going to lose your salvation if you don't. And it's not by works, your salvation unto eternal life, so that no one can boast. So I've heard people boast about how they got saved when they were 12 or 9 or 8, or some people might even say they're in the womb. Since salvation is by faith alone, and since salvation is by grace, not merited, merited, can I correct that spelling? Therefore, it is not by works, which is part of that verse. It is a gift and not of yourself. Since that's true, then... Faith, especially saving faith unto eternal life, cannot be of works, nor can, it be, can works be permitted to validate that faith in any way. Some people, you wouldn't know they were believers. They even, I've heard one lady, uh, she was living with a guy, and, uh, and she kept saying, I'm saved by grace. And I had to say, well, what you say I have to accept because I can't read your mind, and uh, I'm not going to comment on the lifestyle. It's not my business. You can try to open them up to grow as a Christian and let the Holy Spirit convict them. But their lifestyle is none of my business in the sense that all I can do is when asked or have the open situation where I can share what the Bible says, then I might get, let the Holy Spirit do his work. My job is to share the information and it's God, the Holy Spirit, and that person that, for the results. So just as milk is milk before anything is added to it, and so adding something like chocolate to it merely changes it into chocolate plus milk, or chocolate milk. So faith does not need works added to it in order to become faith, especially saving faith unto eternal life. It is already it already is faith. Now you can say, oh, what about James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. That's interesting. A battery without power is dead. Open up your hood. It's still there. It got the, the car where it was at that point. But now it's not growing. The faith is not growing. The, the car is not doing its job, and the Christian is not doing his job if he doesn't have any works. But it's still, he's still a Christian. Once works are added, then the faith becomes faith plus works, the works being an expression of that faith, which already existed in the first place, the, the faith, 
that faith being all that was needed to result in eternal